Hi folks, this is Big Mike, Mike Zlatnik, and today we're going to chat about why investing in real estate is a better choice than investing into the stock market in general. Obviously, circumstances are different for different folks. Uh, this is a high-level discussion, and um, hopefully the, this will be uh, great educational content. Uh, let me go to the wonderful disclaimer. This presentation is for informational educational purposes only. Uh, it is not a recommendation to sell uh, or uh, any kind of advice. We don't give advice at all. This is a personal opinion um, under the free, free speech, again, for informational educational purposes only. If you're interested in our family of funds or uh, syndications, request a PPM, private placement memorandum, to accredit investors only consult with your attorney and CPA professional before making any investment decisions. Hopefully this makes sense. Okay, so just a couple of words about us. Um, we've been doing this since 2009. We have uh, a lot of experience, great track record, and um, we're on a family of diversified funds, spread the risk among many uh, strategies, um, locations, um, uh, operators, and so on and so forth. And we provide typically best access point folks that invest with us, get into the best uh, deals that are available out there, either they're private deals, not available to public at all, or we negotiate better terms as we write bigger checks. Um, our business philosophy investors come first, um, we pride ourselves on a wide glove serv service, and uh, we're fully transparent. We run uh, using third party administ administrators, as well as uh, reputable SEC counsel. We communicate often uh, through emails, um, Zoom calls, um, and other communication mechanisms. So why people invest in stock market? Real basic stuff. Just going to real sort of one-on-one of stock market investing. Number one re reason it's easy to invest. Most folks invest in the stock market just because it's easy. Wall Street has made it very easy to uh, invest, transfer the funds from a bank account, to a brokerage account and to make an investment right on your mobile app, on your phone, and consume a um, stock uh, into your portfolio. And that is very easy. It's just, it's been, it's been automated to that degree. It is incredibly um, uh, simple to do. In addition to that, the Wall Street has trained 401k uh, administrators to uh, write the money into their platform, essentially, uh, most of the plans offered out there uh, don't give you too many options other than to invest in publicly traded securities, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. And a lot of 401k plans basically uh, provide very limited choices of um, typically pretty expensive funds that folks can invest in, and these funds participate in the market. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No, it's just different. It's it's an expensive way to uh, typically participate. The, the fees on these 401ks are generally high, but folks get exposure to the stock market. Uh, in my opinion, again, uh, stock market is not necessarily the best way to invest, but it's the easiest way to invest. And then again, 401k, most administrators made it simple and easy. They build a relationship with Wall Street fir firms um, to channel a lot of dollars that coming from the retirement uh, plans into effectively stock market. And most investments are liquid, fairly easy to uh, get liquidity in the stock market. Click a button, sell a stock or st sell a fund, and then you get liquidity, if not immediately, then next day. Another reason is that uh, a lot of big banks and brokerage uh, financial advisors promote uh, their mutual funds through their um, sales organizations, and asset management uh, teams. So it's very lucrative for big banks and brokerages to manage your money. There's nothing particularly wrong with that. It's just, it, it, it's, it's something that you have to be aware uh, that works really well for the Wall Street firms, uh, for the brokerages, because they collect fees, asset management fees, um, various sales commissions and so on and so forth. So uh, they've built essentially a network of these financial advisors. And because they are the gatekeepers, because your money is sitting in the banks, 
it becomes very easy for folks uh, to hear an opinion of a uh, bank officer who offers them an investment in this fund or that fund. Uh, and then there are substantial commissions that those folks get paid. There's a lot of research available, uh, mutual fund ratings, and plenty of do-it-yourself portfolio management tools. So that's why folks invest in the stock market. But there are plenty of flaws in the stock market. Folks uh, that invest in the stock market, one of the major flaws is lack of all predictability. What does that mean? Well, how do you know is the stock market going up or down tomorrow? Or for how long? Predictability is very low uh, in the stock market. In general, there's almost no predictability. You, you sort of, you trust the market that the market will do it for you, or you trust certain specific issue, certain fund that the fund manager will do it for you, or you invest in a given um, um, stock like Microsoft, and you trust that the company knows what they're doing. Is there anything wrong with that? No, but that's one of the flaws. It's a lack of predictability. And then there are periods of very high volatility. And uh, uh, periods of high volatility, uh, give heartburn uh, to a number of investors. Not everyone can stomach the volatility. So stock market investing, as much as it's a fun journey during um, a great market run, it becomes very unpleasant experience um, when the market um, is volatile and, and the investment loses value. So something to keep in mind. And then, um, Another really interesting point that the reported average annual returns in the stock market could be misleading. And I'll explain that in just a couple of slides. Um, so something to keep in mind that the reported returns are not necessarily uh, what the real numbers look like when you look at your account. Uh, typically, stock market invest investing has very limited tax benefits. Um, the gains on stocks held for uh, 12 months or longer typically fall in the capital gains ra range but there are really no other um, tax benefits in the stock market. Some dividends are, quali are classified as qualified dividends, um, not double taxed, but beyond that, the benefits are limited. And it's really hard to retire on the dividend yield uh, by owning a bunch of stocks. It's a lot easier to retire by, by owning real estate, income producing real estate, just for comparison's sake. And then there's very limited alignment of interest between the financial advisors and investors. Again, as I mentioned previously, you have your money in a given bank, you uh, meet with their financial advisor, their financial advisor could be, and most likely is a commissioned uh, salesperson uh, or a money manager that gets paid uh, for managing your money, not necessarily to generate returns. They don't get paid a portion of the upside. Instead, they get paid uh, either sales commissions or they get paid an asset management fee. So something to keep in mind, again, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that, but the alignment of interest is minimal. I haven't seen too much alignment of interest where uh, the uh, folks that manage your money get paid a portion of the upside and so they generate a certain level of return for you. And that exists in real estate uh, as a common practice and is very limited in the stock market, almost non-existent. So why uh, folks invest in real estate? In contrast to the stock market, the predictability of real estate is much, much better. So it's good predictability and generally speaking, lower volatility. Now, not on every project, there are plenty of projects with more risk and volatility, but in general, real estate is a lot less volatile and a lot more predictable. And you can also invest with people who you know, like, and trust. You can actually build the relationship with folks that you're comfortable to invest with. When you invest in a Wall Street, typically you're investing into big, um, 40,000 pound gorillas, uh, these huge mutual funds that manage billions of dollars. And then it's very difficult to build a relationship with the manager. Unless you're writing gigantic checks. Real estate also has big tax benefits. Um, just to mention a few, uh, depreciation is one of the very few, the very large um, benefits. Real estate allows, allows like-kind exchange, like a 1031 uh, exchange. When you sell um, an appreciated property, you can exchange into a, another property. Stock market, you cannot. You sell for an appreciated stock, you have to pay capital gains tax. Um, in addition to that, uh, real estate provides a bunch of uh, benefits that can magnify returns, such as leverage. 
So leverage returns to build wealth a lot faster than the stock market. And typically, uh, in stock market, you could certainly create a um, a margin uh, trading account, and you can borrow against the stock in your um, in your account on a margin. With uh, real estate, it works differently. You could typically go to a bank and borrow from a bank, uh, and th that borrowing is typically three to one ratio. So for every dollar of investment, you can get three dollars of a bank mortgage to acquire real estate. This is normal and typical. So the leverage in real estate magnifies the returns. Obviously, leverage works both ways. If the real estate doesn't do well, leverage could magnify the losses. Anyway, uh, uh, control over how much risk you are taking. So you could choose to invest in different type of deals with different level of risk. You can choose to invest in a first lien mortgage, be in a first lien position and take very little risk, to generate good defensive yield on your money. Uh, or you could take an equity position and uh, be comfortable with a mortgage ahead of you and still generate pretty well downside protected returns while benefiting from uh, leveraged investment. Um, also, you would get a real estate, you, you can get a real estate um, tax shielded cash flows. Again, depreciation uh, is one of these benefits that can create uh, a pseudo deduction. Um, and uh, you can cash flow for years tax-free. And then you have also ability to refinance and take out cash tax-free, which is a very powerful uh, incentive to participate in uh, real estate. And then it's also a hard asset. It's a great hedge against inflation. Typically, uh, in a highly inflationary environment, real estate rents uh, rise with inflation or better. So um, these are your typical benefits in investing in real estate. There are other benefits, but these are just some of the uh, most important ones. There are limitations uh, investing in real estate as well. So one of the limit, one of the major limitations is the fact that most of the investments are illiquid, something to keep in mind. What does it mean? It means that you can't click a button and sell real estate like you sell a stock tomorrow or in, in, in the next 15 minutes. It takes many months to sell real estate. You have to put a property on the market. Uh, the property has to be shown. Um, price has to be negotiated. So to make a long story short, it's not very liquid. Um, but over time, of course, you can sell real estate. It's harder to invest. So in general, with a stock, you just pick a stock, click a button buy, or you pick a mutual fund, and you click a button. And before you know, you have your own shares of that investment. With real estate, you need to do your homework. You need to do due diligence. You, you, you need to plan and prepare. Uh, also, you have to write bigger checks because you are going to invest typically in deals that require uh, sizable amounts of money. For example, you can invest in a stock. You can buy a stock for $1,000 or even $5,000. In real estate, it's pretty hard to invest $5,000. You generally, um, unless you go to these um, fractional investments uh, or crowdfunding platforms, which you have to do the diligence on as well. And you have to understand what you're investing into. Most of these investments will require sizable checks. So you can invest a check into a fund, but most funds or syndications take a minimum of 50 or $100,000. So it's a very different type of um, uh, check size versus the stock market. You certainly can write a big check into a stock. You can buy millions of dollars worth of certain stock. Um, but it all, you, But the stock market allows access to small investors where real estate in general a certain size check is uh, required to be invested. And then you have to pick your partners carefully. So folks you invest with, either they are partners in a deal or you invest with a syndicator or an operator, you have to do the due diligence. You have to know, like, and trust them and make sure that you are investing with good people, with great skills, great uh, integrity, the ability to execute, and so on and so forth. And then deal structures may be more complex. With the stock, you can just click a button and buy common shares of Microsoft stock. When you invest in real estate, you have to understand what you're investing in. Are you investing in debt or mortgage? Are you investing in a preferred equity? Or are you investing in common equity? And sometimes there are uh, joint venture partners and uh, level of complexity could be higher. So stock market historic returns. We'll, we'll chat about this just a little bit. Uh, again, I'm not an expert by any means at all. And uh, this information is what I understand and know. 
uh, it's an approximate in nature. So stock market, uh, the claims that what I have heard is that in the stock market, um, average annual returns have been around 10% for the last 40 years. I don't know how accurate this number is, but I have heard that this has been the number for a long time. And here in this chart, uh, on the right side, you see sort of average historic monthly return, monthly, for January, February, March, um, April, and so on. Uh, and some months uh, are, are negative on average, but I guess blended average between all these months, historically, theoretically speaking, it's a 10% annual return. Um, again, uh, this is, these are the figure, figures that uh, Wall Street has provided. And we'll talk a little bit how so these numbers could be very misleading. In a minute, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this, um, that, that the average annual return of 10% doesn't necessarily mean that folks get 10% in their account every year. And not only every year, but when you look on a cumulative basis, sometimes the average annual return is very misleading versus what they actually receive. And we'll see that in just a minute. So let's look at the stock market. Uh, and how the math could be misleading. So let's just say you, you invest a million dollars into stock market. In year one, the market is up. It's doing phenomenal. It goes up 40%. And the next year, the market is very bad, and it drops 20% the following year. Um, at the end of the first year, your million dollars becomes 1,400,000. It's up 40%. And the next year, it drops 20% from that 1.4 million down to 1,112,000. That's your 80% uh, of the uh, 1.4 million. It dropped 20%, what's left is 80%. So the average annual return, you take 40% year one, and then the second year you made negative 20%. So 40 and negative 20, and then you divide that by two. Then And then the average of that is 10%, or is it? Um, so, the way folks have explained to me, this is the way it works on an average annual return. You take a return every year, and then you add the return to year one to return to year two. And now you see this map, return to year one is 40%, return to year two is negative 20%, and then divide that by two years, and then the average is 10%. But let's look at what you actually made. So your profit on your investment is $112,000 uh, on your million dollars investment. And you invested for two years. So your actual return per year is 56,000. I took the total return you made, divided it by two. So the, the actual return per year is only 5.6%, not, not 10%. So this math is very, very misleading. And depending, depending on what the market does, the average annual return could look like 10%. But the actual return following this math could look like 5.6% or 7%. I heard the figure of around 7% is what you get, not 10, 10%. Not an expert in stock market by any means. Do your own research. But that's my observation is that when you have the years of high volatility, they skew the average return substantially up and down. And as a result, uh, the overall average is a misleading versus the actual returns that folks get using this very simple math. Now let's look at the stock market returns and what they depend on. So the stock market returns really depend on Fed policy and action. Um, the Fed opens their mouth and the market responds. As crazy as it sounds, uh, there's a lot of um, experts out there, analysts, uh, fund managers who actively follow Fed. There's nothing wrong following Fed. I love following the Fed. It's, it's, a, they, it's an exciting um, topic. Unfortunately, Fed has so much power and they have so much control that they can actually impact the market very, very substantially. I don't want to call them manipulate the market, but they, they most certainly impact the market to a very large degree through their Fed policies and their um, uh, money printing machine called, called Federal Reserve Balance Sheet. Now, overall economy obviously impacts stock market returns. The economy is doing great. Um, GDP is growing, there's an economic expansion, stock market quite often in anticipation of actually growth uh, gets ahead of the, of the economic growth. So uh, 
th there's another chart which I'm not showing here, but generally speaking, stock market uh, predicts uh, expansions and recessions. It kind of leads them in essence. So overall economy obviously plays an impact. Market sentiment plays a big impact. Um, right now, we, we can hear consumer sentiment is low or a consumer sentiment is high or investor sentiment is, 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 is great or investor sentiment is low. And typically based on the investment sentiment, the news are evaluated. So if most of the market is very pessimistic, sometimes a great news is not even viewed as a, as a great news. And the, uh, the reverse is, is true when there's a bad news and the market has a negative sentiment, it, it, it's viewed as a really bad news. Um, earnings, so earnings is the only fundamental thing that drives the market. If you think about this, long-term earnings growth is what um, impacts the value of each stock. This is back to the Warren Buffett who looks at the fundamental uh, of the investing. But the stock market trades not only on fundamentals, but also trades on a lot of um, um, market forces or market, um, as I mentioned, sentiment, Fed policy, and so on. So on a really long-term basis, like Warren Buffett, you buy a stock that makes long-term fundamental sense. They want <laughs> the company you want to own forever. However, in the short run, there's a lot of volatility in the market in relation to things outside of some of the fundamentals of a given company. So real estate returns depend on rent inflation and market appreciation. These are a few of the key factors that impact forces that drive returns in real estate. So rent inflation simply means um, as uh, uh, there's inflation in the market, rents go up. If, it, if there was a deflation in the market, rents would go down. But in general, on a long-term basis, rents typically go up. There's rent inflation. And then that creates appreciation effect on the market. So it's a market forces. As rents go up, the prices go up. It's, it's just a normal part of the market. Next element of what drives the returns is value at work or forced appreciation. So there's a market appreciation mentioned previously, and then there's a forced appreciation. The forced appreciation is the value creation that is generated through the work of a, an operator on a given pro property, a sponsor or an operator. What does that mean? So it means renovations, it means um, improvements to the property, it means rent increases, a number of other the work that gets done that uh, improves the value of the asset and that creates forced appreciation. Obviously, property management plays a very important role. Uh, good property managers can increase um, efficiency of the property, increase cash flows, in, in, increase leasing, and overall net operating income and lower expenses. And uh, local and overall economy obviously play a role. And the reason I mentioned local, because real estate is all local. That's the reason uh, it's not just overall economy, stock market, of course, there could be local impact on a given company in a given location, um, but it is a lot more connected in the stock market to the sentiment of the market. With the real estate, um, it's a lot more local. And of course, uh, there's overall economy, overall real estate uh, or regional real estate. So now we go in the territory, why uh, we answering the question, why I believe real estate is far better um, choice than a stock market for a lot of investors. Not true for everyone, but for a lot of people who build wealth slowly, but consistently over time, stock market has not been the matter of choice, but real estate has been. Of course, there are Warren Buffett's of the world who can pick and choose great stocks for many years and they, they, they're great value investing in the stock market. And so much more power to that, uh, I have nothing but uh, great admiration and love for Warren Buffett and other uh, value investors. They are very good at selecting um, great stocks. With real estate, it's a little different. Um, value add projects uh, could create very substantial opportunity for the investment to go up uh, in value through the work of the operator. It's almost like picking your great value stocks in real estate it is picking the right operators and the right strategies and the right projects that create value. So you're basically buying into the projects at the cost basis where the value becomes much higher 
upon completion of the strategy. So well-executed value-add projects generate target returns substantially higher than stock market returns, in my observation and opinion. So typical return between 15 and 20% uh, is nothing unusual. These numbers are absolutely normal, typical, uh, on a three to five year hold. Uh, and the term that uh, I use here is IRR. IRR stands for internal rate of return, which is really a better way to, to express um, returns than uh, average annual ROI. And I'll cover that in just a minute. But IRR is a genuinely uh, more accurate number because the formula that computes IRR includes the time when the money is invested and the cash is generated and paid to the investors through the cash flows, refinancing, and sale events. So 15% uh, IRR, 15% to 20% IRR, is normal, typical, and common. And uh, uh, many projects in real estate uh, uh, allow investors to generate that kind of level of return uh, while the stock market could certainly outperform certain years these numbers. But consistently over time, in my opinion, real estate provides substantially better wealth growing opportunity than uh, stock market. And some of the projects that value at work um, is applied to some of them are development, some are redevelopment, and some include renovation. There needs to be a value add. And value add is different. In some cases, value add have nothing to do with the work. An example, uh, with value add, you can buy a uh, defaulted mortgage and foreclose on a property. That is still value add work. You're adding value to generate a foreclosure and to create, to take the property through a process. Or a value could be buying a shopping plaza, value add work, and selling out parcels, generating value that way. There are many ways to generate value add, but normally it could be a value add multifamily where apartments get purchased, renovated, rents increased, and the value of the property is increased. So the, there are many ways to do value add, but typically it's development, redevelopment, or renovation strategy and requires a high um, capability operator. Uh, why why this, this is very important? Because uh, value add generally carries some more risk in theory because development, redevelopment, uh, or innovation, there's more risk involved with these type of projects. Some projects have a very moderate level of risk. Some have high and some have very moderate, very small amount of risk. It depends. But in general, value at work requires competent operator to execute on the strategy. So selecting the right operator is a critical uh, piece of the success of these type of projects. So why forced appreciation makes all the difference. Here is an example to understand how this value at work works in real estate. Very basic example. It's common sense. But at the same time, I wanted to give you a little color in the numbers. So let's just say there's a multifamily property. And we have actually a project, which I'll mention um, in a couple of slides uh, further, that go is going through this plan. So the current average rent across all the apartments in the portfolio is $1,000 a month. And then the projected post-renovation average rent after the units are fully renovated, improved, uh, and uh, leased up at, at the market rent is $1,500 a month. The property current units are aged uh, and the rents are below the market, while fully renovated um, units at full market rent are projected to generate $1,500 a month rent. That is a approximately $500 a month uh, increase. And if you annualize it, that's $6,000 a year. So $6,000 a year of additional net operating income growth typically implies in real estate a value increase of at least $100,000. In many cases, more, more like $120,000. But for sake of this uh, argument and being conservative, $6,000 a year increase in net operating income would generate approximately $100,000 increase of value of the, of the property. Uh, to achieve that, capital has to be invested. And approximately on this project, $20,000 per door investment is budgeted. Is this high or is this low or is this normal? Um, for this type of scenario, it is very normal. Uh, $20,000 investment, it should generate um, the improvement to the property, both common areas, external um, 
or investment of the property, as well as internal uh, improvements of the units, to make them more attractive to potential tenants, uh, both, again, the, the property itself, the common areas, the clubhouse, the pool, everything else, as well as uh, the units them themselves, the new flooring, uh, the new appliances, the new kitchen cabinets, the new bathroom. Um, so that internal renovation, all of it, the 20,000 a door combined with external is what creates this um, improvement. And uh, execution predictability is really, really important. So it's not just the cost, but having the uh, crews, the people, uh, the construction workers to execute it, getting the materials at the predictable price requires competent operator who is able to get uh, those resources as part of the organization, their vertically integrated operator. And here is an example, when you uh, grow the value by about $100,000 per door, and you spend about $20,000 a door in investment, you wind up generating approximately $80,000 a door in profit. Now, not all projects are like this, some more, some less. This is an example how forced appreciation works. So there's improvement in the cash flow, but the big part that improvement in the cash flow generates a very substantial increase in the value for each of these um, apartments or per door. And on sale, uh, commercial real estate typically trades on a cap rate. Cap rate stands for capitalization rate. And that's a multiple uh, of the net operating income. So this is an example of how this would work on a value add project. Another important educational concept, and this is real concept, this is what professional real estate investors use, uh, is you always use IRR, internal rate of return, rather than the average annual return. As I showed you before, average annual return is highly misleading, and folks can manipulate that information and make it look pretty in the stock market. With real estate, uh, it can also be used. But here's an example of real estate, so just so you understand, that the average annual return figure is actually, um, well, when you're given that figure, and uh, it, it 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 will be higher than the IRR. In other words, when a project projected to generate an IRR of around 19%, again, depends on when the cash flow uh, come comes out of the project. An average annual return on that project could be 25%. So uh, here's an example. If you doubled your money in four years and didn't really receive much um, distributions on the way, maybe a little bit, uh, but most of it was appreciation. Uh, on exit, you doubled your money. Uh, the average annual return, typically double in four years, and you take it's 100% return in four years, makes an average annual return of 25%. But the IRR is only 19% because it, it effectively computes the compounding or, or equivalent of. So I would rather hear IRR of 19% than average annual return of 19%. And that IRR figure is substantially better than an average annual return. I hope this makes sense. I just wanted to convey this as a lot of projects are advertised out there based on an average annual return of 20%. Well, what is the IRR on that? And then IRR on that similar project would be 16%. Just understand that IRR is a better figure uh, for you as an investor uh, versus the uh, average annual return. So here's an example. Uh, we have a project uh, called Michigan 4. Uh, I don't know when you're going to be watching this video, but uh, right now the project is open at a time of recording. If you're interested uh, in this project, please reach out. If it's still open, We'll be delighted to send you PPM, a uh, private placement memorandum to accredit investors only. But um, I wanted to show you some examples of what this project, what a good project looks like. We absolutely love the project. Uh, it's a large project. There are four multifamily assets in um, uh, suburbs of Detroit, and they had 38 doors in total. And this project has a lot of depreciation benefits. So you could invest $100,000 in a project and generate first year depreciation of $190 thousand through bonus depreciation, which is a very, very powerful. For a lot of folks, uh, this means uh, massive tax savings. So why? Well, one of the major benefits, you could sell appreciated real estate, have passive gains, and you could offset those gains with depreciation you receive on this investment. 
These are passive losses. Depreciation is a form of a passive loss. So it's a very powerful um, uh, way to invest and get massive tax benefits. Overall, the projected IRR on the project, again, as I mentioned, IRR is much more valuable than average annual return, is between 15 and 19% IRR, which would imply higher average annual return. That's the way the math works. And then there's an EQM. EQM stands for equity multiple. So folks are projected to uh, generate EQM between 1.78 to 2x, essentially doubling their money. Uh, and this project is underwritten for a four-year hold. Uh, and you'll see in a minute what happens if a uh, hold takes less time, it's split faster. Anyway, in this project, we're raising 18 and a half million. Uh, if you have any interest or to participate, a bunch of money has already been committed. But if you're interested, uh, please reach out. Happy to uh, share a PPM with you and have a conversation. So here's an example how IRR works. It's really, really powerful concept. So IRR math is a function of when the money goes in and when the money comes out. So if the money comes out faster, it's flipped faster, the IRR gets very substantially magnified. One of the ways to think about IRR is sort of effectively an equivalent of compounded average annual return. So uh, look at uh, this investment Michigan for. If the deal is flipped in four years, the target IRR is between 15 and 19%. But if it's flipped in three years, the average annual, sorry, the IRR is bumped up to between 21 to 25%. This is a much better deal um, in essence on a three year flip uh, on an average uh, IRR basis. On The way to think of the IRR as I said, is a compounded average return. And that's the power of this. So IRR shoots through the roof, it goes higher when the property is flipped faster. That's about it. Uh, hope this, this was educational, hope this was helpful. Please feel free to reach out to Alina or Head of Investor Relations or myself with any follow-up questions and request uh, PPM if you have interest in this deal or our family or funds. Appreciate your time and attention. Until the next time, um, have a great day.